Um, hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Your AI Transformation. My name is Patrick Moran and I'm on the marketing team here at H2O.AI. I'd love to start off by introducing our speakers. Ingrid Burton is CMO at H2O.AI. She has several decades of experience leading global marketing teams to build brands, create demand, and engage and grow communities. She also serves as an independent director on the Arrowhive board. Prior to H2O.AI, she was CMO at Hortonworks, where she drove a brand and marketing transformation and created ecosystem programs that positioned the company for growth. At SAP, she co-created the cloud strategy, led SAP HANA in analytics marketing, and drove developer outreach. She also served as CMO at Silver Spring Networks and Plantronics after spending almost 20 years at Sun Microsystems, where she was head of Sun Marketing, led Java Marketing uh, to build out a thriving Java developer community, championed and led open source initiatives, and drove various product and strategic initiatives. A developer early in her career, Ingrid holds a BA in math with a concentration in computer science from San Jose State University. Benjamin Cox is a current MBA candidate at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, majoring in business analytics and econometrics and statistics. Prior to joining H2O.AI, he led Ernst & Young's first artificial intelligence incubator with an industry focus on financial crimes and has worked as a graduate intern data scientist at Nike. He's, help, he's helping run Explainable AI and AI transformation as well as supporting Patrick Hall and Navdeep Gill as the contributing writer um, on their recent NeurIPS paper titled Proposed Guidelines for the Re Responsible Use of Explainable Machine Learning. He also volunteered as a business sustainability advisor to WildMe and he's held positions at NTT Data, UBS, and Citi. He graduated from the University of Charleston with a BS in econ economics and finance. Now, before I hand it over to Ingrid and Ben, I'd like to go over the following housekeeping items. Please feel free to send us your questions throughout the session via the questions tab in your console. We'll be happy to answer them towards the end of the webinar. And this webinar is being recorded. A copy of the webinar recording and slide deck will be made available after the presentation is over. Now, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Ingrid. Hey there, thank you, Patrick, and welcome everybody to today's webinar. We're, we're really excited to share um, some information and, and give you a look into what we believe is one of the most profound uh, impacts in the market today technologically, and that is an AI transformation. So what we want to do today is really talk to you about how you can embark upon your AI journey, how you as you, and your company can start your AI transformation, or if you've already started your AI transformation, to kind of give you some more uh, ideas about other areas of your business that you could uh, use AI and machine learning for. All right, uh, next slide, Ben. So first of all, a little bit about us. If you don't know us, uh, just quickly, we're an AI company focused on machine learning. Uh, we're the open source leader in AI and machine learning with H2O Open Source. Uh, one of the, the key frameworks that has been out in the market for a number of years now, um, 20,000 companies use that. Um, we also are the leader and visionary around automatic machine learning as referenced by Gartner in two recent MQs um, with H2O driverless AI, an automatic machine learning platform. And then later here this year, we'll be fully unveiling H2OQ, an AI platform for business users. What's exciting about us is, you know, we're a, a mid-stage startup, um, and we're also seeing a lot of global growth around the world right now. We're focused on democratizing AI for all. That is our mission statement. And what does that mean? That means for businesses, we want to make AI accessible to as many business people and data scientists as possible. For people themselves, whether they're, uh, you know, students, whether they're um, other you know, data scientists, we want to make sure that AI is for everyone and we're actively coaching student populations as young as uh, elementary school all the way up uh, through the college level, et cetera. So we have an academic program where if you are a student currently, we'd love to give you a free license of driverless AI. If you're a professor, we do the same. And then we also are in actively involved in the impact for social good, so AI for good. We truly do believe that AI can be used for greatness in this world. And just as an aside, of course, we're all in the middle of this pandemic. Our Kaggle Grandmasters, some of the experts in the world, are working furiously on some data sets right now to see if we can find 
different patterns and help any way we can. So we're actively involved in the healthcare um, community right now. If you are a healthcare um, person, contact us. We want to help. All right, so what are the, some of the key trends that are happening in data science today and what we're hearing from the market? Look, we talk to a lot of companies. And what we're seeing is that AI and machine learning are kind of, quote unquote, graduating from the research labs, from the data science teams, and you hear from C-suite executives um, and business users alike that they're being asked to look at AI and machine learning to, in order to inject it into their business. Why? Because it will give them a, a competitive advantage. So the transformation we see is happening across all lines of business, whether it's marketing, you know, go-to-market, finance, HR, you know, manufacturing, within a business or a supply chain, within a business, we see AI having an impact across the board. We're also hearing a lot from our customers, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, uh, prospects and customers, that one of the biggest challenges is change management. It's cultural. Transformation is hard. Um, so it's hard from the standpoint of people are adverse. You know, we're all a little bit resistant to change, so you have to think about what is it going to, what's going to happen within your company, your business processes, the way in which you've conducted yourself in business, how does AI or machine learning impact that? So it's really important to understand some of those, those concerns that management teams may have. Um, if you're a data scientist, if you're a business user, you want to kind of, you know, understand that this is, you know, this is change, man change management and we're here to help. Next slide. So transformation, the definition of the transformation, in our opinion, we've been saying this for a number of years, is that your data plus AI plus your people will equal that transformation. This isn't just technological, as I just said. This is about your data and your people and applying AI to it to transform your business. Many of the companies, so go ahead, Ben. Um, why is an AI transformation happening now? I think it's it's somewhat obvious, but um, we want to make sure that people understand why they need to be embarking on their journey right now, why companies need to be embarking on their journey right now. So way back in, in time, thousands of years ago, there was math. In the 1950s, math and statistics were really important. In the 1940s, actually during the Second World War, and as we got to the moonshots, you know, math and statistics were you know, really becoming critical. In the 1980s, we saw you know, inexpensive computing or more, more expansive um, computing. And that AI was, you know, I knew people in the 1980s that were getting degrees in AI. Um, but they were doing really early work and doing great work as well. Then as we saw the 2000s emerge, you know, as CPUs and storage became enterprise-wide, the Internet of Things started to happen, maybe even in the 1990s, late 1990s. Uh, the internet, of course, emerged. The, you know, in the digital, uh, in the 2010s, you know, you've heard, all heard a lot about digital transformation. Digital transformation. We all need a digital transformation. What was happening in the backdrop is you had big data databases. You'd see Nvidia introducing GPUs. There was more efficient storage, faster compute, miniaturization, networks everywhere, wireless everywhere. People had, you know, billions of devices everywhere. Uh, data science skills were getting uh, more and more uh, important, and the public clouds, of course, they started early in uh, the 2000s, but they really started to emerge as a viable business model as well as, you know, IT infrastructure for many, many businesses. Here we are in 2020 where it's the perfect storm, right? You've got the compute, you've got the storage, you've got the high, you know, high performance, you have more people graduating with data science degrees or, uh, you know, in master's programs and PhDs. Uh, you can learn online. There's a really a fast ramp to getting to data science, and there's really a fast ramp to getting to the cloud. So where is it happening? Where is AI transformation happening today? So H2O, of course, being an open source leader in AI, on the left-hand side, the, the stats there are, Half of the Fortune 500 is using H2O open source. Many of the top 10 banks around the world, many of the top insurance companies and health care organizations are using H2O open source. 
on the right hand side of the slide, all the logos there, is just some of the many, many companies uh, that are customers of H2O that are probably using driverless and doing everything from, you know, bond predictions to, um, you know, uh, uh, credit scoring, fraud detection, and so forth. So we partner with companies to make them an AI company and help them on their AI transformation. So number one, we're going to guide companies on their AI journey. We have the experts, so Kaggle Grandmasters, expert data scientists, distributed computing experts, and developers to help many companies get started. And we've learned a lot from our customers over the last um, several years and can reference hundreds, and if not thousands, of use cases of where customers have been very successful in using AI machine learning. So we're not a professional services organization. We're, we're going to be your teacher. We're going to teach your, your analytics people, your data scientists, your developers, your data engineers how to become data scientists themselves. We want to come in and help you with your use cases, do use case workshops and so forth and help you. Because we have software. We have world-class technology, and we provide world-class support. Uh, Gartner just um, put that in their magic quadrant for the cloud and AI developer services magic quadrant, saying that we had world-class support and technology. And then we want to work with you on your future endeavors. We brainstorm and do workshops with companies all the time on what new innovations and new business models uh, can they drive with an AI transformation. And here's some of the results that we're seeing from some of our customers. In the digital marketing front, one of our customers is getting a 700% um, uplift in their marketing campaign effectiveness. One of our insurance companies that we're working with is getting upwards of $20 million, actually they told us $20 million per year savings uh, with a central data science team uh, of 45 people that are doing everything from uh, insurance underwriting to customer churn predictions, next best customer, et cetera. In the world of fraud detection, this is a major credit card company that has seen double, has doubled their effectiveness in IDing fraud. Um, that saves them millions of dollars. Um, in supply chain optimization, this is a manufacturing company that saw a reduction of 25% in planning uh, their materials and where the materials needed to be in their supply chain. In the, in the healthcare segment, um, this is Kaiser Permanente who is um, able to save lives by detecting sepsis more effectively. Right now, we're working with a companies, a healthcare institutions like Kaiser on determining staffing requirements in the pandemic. They're running models currently. We're still wait, you know, we're working with them very actively on modeling you know, where their staffing requirements are. And also, ICU uh, readmissions, because you want to not um, discharge a patient and send them home and readmit them. That's very costly. You want to know exactly when to uh, discharge them. And ER admissions as well. So healthcare is, is top of mind for everybody right now. We're working with a number of healthcare companies on this. Uh, the lower uh, left um, row, let's start there, debt scoring. This is a company in Brazil that is working with Brazilian citizens in order to reduce debt. Apparently in Brazil, if you have one bad credit score, you'll never get credit again. So this, they're trying to prevent that and help consumers with debt scoring. So they have got a, a, it's a small startup, actually not that small, with about 15 data scientists that are doing debt reduction and they, Brazilians are able to um, retire about $10 million worth of debt based on their debt scoring platform. This is an interesting use case um, that I'm not sure has happened or propagated around the world, but great opportunity. opportunity. Propensity to lease, this is a, a company that does real estate marketing. They're saving because they put together a call center saving um, model using H2O and driverless AI. They're saving their real estate customers a million and a half dollars per month and that number is growing by directing calls directly to the right agent at the right time and finding the right prospect. So saving a lot of time and money. Bad credit detection and 8% more accurate predictions of bad credit. What does this mean? This means that if you know, a bank doesn't lend you uh, credit because you have a bad credit score or past historical bad credit, but let's say you have a really great job, they may deny you credit. Okay? So what they're trying to do is they realize that going through the cracks were people with, you know, quote, unquote, bad credit that were getting through, 
are not getting through and not getting credit, so they left those people behind. So now they've gotten an upper, uh, a lift of 8% more accuracy in their credit scoring um, because it's more personal and looks into a, takes into account you as a full person, not just the fact that you missed a couple of payments here and there, so therefore you've been deemed bad credit. So credit scoring is a big use case uh, that we see a lot of the time. Um, model building reduction of 50%, we see that all the time with an automatic machine learning platform like driverless AI. Um, data scientists definitely see that all the time. And then customer churn prediction. This is a big use case in retail, in the telcos, in the banks. Um, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, you want to prevent churn. Customer churn is a big one. You, it would be difficult uh, to go secure a new customer. So with that, I was going to hand it over to Ben to talk about other use cases that we're seeing and other possibilities for your business. Ben? Yeah. So, so I'll jump in. Um, you know, I spent a lot of my career essentially doing consulting around AI, talking about where can you find alpha, where can you find lift um, for machine learning, artificial intelligence, and, and like. Um, and and there's, there's a lot of scenarios that come up more often than not. Um, you know, and these sort of skew towards finance, but it's, but it's worth considering because, honestly, the, the cool thing about this space is that it can apply across industry. You know, a, a, lot of, a lot of industries have the same problems, right? Churn, efficiency, effectiveness, that kind of thing. Um, so a few examples. I'm just going to kind of rattle them off here. Um, you know, if, if we're talking about financial services, one thing you want to know is, like, how effective are your brokers being? Um, are they able to sell the amount that you want them to sell? How can you kind of, like, quantify that? Um, that's a prime opportunity for, for AIML. Um, performance review, you know, a lot of companies look at the end of the year to think about how do we start to see results and how do we start to actually quantify how well, you know, employees and performers are doing. Um, that's, that's another prime example. Um, attrition prediction, I think this is, like, really top of mind for a lot of companies. They want to know when and why people are going to leave the company. Um, you know, hiring is not a cheap expense, and finding talent is one of most companies' biggest concerns. Um, so, you, you know, you can run models on this, and you can figure out, you know, where the, the trends are going and where, where people are actually starting to consider this thing. Um, and, then, and then, you know, recruiting outreach, right? Like, I think a lot of companies are trying to streamline, optimize, and figure out how effectively they can get the best talent and how they can do it that doesn't cost them, let's say, $70,000 per candidate. Um, so there's a lot of steps in, in HR that can actually, you know, lean into thinking about how do you start to acquire talent. Um, so for finance and financial services, I think this is, like, really, really common. Um, a lot of finance within companies is, is pretty redundant or pretty rote. Um, so if you start thinking about payroll, um, pricing optimization, audit, um, financial crime, um, or just, just really a lot of the tasks in in-house finance at major companies is pretty, pretty redundant. And, and you can start to start to think about use cases with IML to really start to apply some, some value props to this. And, and these are pretty critical. You know, we, we, we get calls about this all the time, and I think it's super important to consider. Because, you, you know, you have these businesses that have all these typical arms, but the thing is, is a lot of, you know, 80% of finance within companies is around, like, data preparation, data organization, and kind of getting things in to, you know, the typical balance sheet statements that you might see and start to really drive some decisions from. Um, IP and ops. Um, I think this is this, this has become increasingly critical over time. Um, we we hear about this all the time. Like I think this kind of gets I don't want to say thrown to the wayside, but I think it's really important to understand if you are a major company or a mid-sized company, thinking about how much you might spend on cloud, what is your cybersecurity risk, um, how do you start to think about like IT ticketing and 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 processing for IT issues. These are super, super big issues that come up and actually have a material impact on your balance sheet and your cash flow savings. Um, so this is one of the things that com comes up a lot. I think, you know, cloud or EC2 or AWS budget is, is very top of mind for most folks because now, we, you know, we're in the post-digital transformation era 
where we see a lot of data and we're trying to figure out how to access it and how to utilize it most effectively. So this comes up a lot. Um, and I think, you know, IT and cyber tends to be this area that kind of gets, like, forgotten about. But it's super, super critical because especially when you get into the prediction business, you start to learn that, you know, it, everything's fine until it's not. So it's important to keep it top of mind. Um, customer support, customer service is, w was also a very top of mind business um, when AI and ML started. Um, I think one of the first first use cases that was super popular across the industry was something like call center automation. Um, natural language processing and sort of, you know, kind of categorization has really helped our ability to understand why customers are calling, why customers are reaching out to us, what are the issues at hand. And, you know, it, it makes us really so much better at responding to these issues, right? You know, the, the reason somebody's calling if they want to wire $75,000 out versus calling because they lost their, you know, their banking card or their, like, you know, their credit card, it are very different issues, and you should handle them quite differently. So it, it improves our ability to be able to, to reach out to them and understand their needs at real time. Um, and additionally, I think there's a couple of other, like, higher-profile cases. You know, when you think about auto-disclose auto -disclose or fiduciary duty, you know, when you are dealing with a, you know, a financial representative or an advisor or a banker who you're trying to, you know, kind of guide you in some material decisions in your life, you want to know that they're being able to make the right decisions. And, and that's something that comes up a lot. You know, financial advisors have to tell you certain things that they're about to make decisions for your future, right? And, and we want to know. And, and we want to be able to say they are, they are disclosing the information that you need to hear they need to be warning you about the risks that come with your decisions. A lot of these things are super, super material to, you know, everything from, you know, a, a billion-dollar investment bank to, you know, a, a mom-and-pop, you know, financial advisory shop. So it, it's really important to understand these things. Um, so taking your ad journey, um, here's the thing. I, I've spent a lot of my life kind of advising firms on how they need to start considering these prior, priorities. Um, and we've kind of boiled it down to five key things, right? I, I, I think some of them actually get overlooked a good bit. Um, so I, I kind of want to walk you through it. So create a data culture, right? I think firms, there, there's been a digitization era where we start to move towards, you know, cloud, relational databases, and all these things. And we have all this data. But I think a lot of companies aren't really assessing the risks correctly and thinking about, okay, now we have this information, how do we monetize it? Um, and a lot of firms are very quick to think, you know, to get to the finish line of how do we monetize it, but they don't think about the steps along the way. So what, what we would impress on firms to do is really think about how do we start to segue to the new era where we talk about creating a data culture and understanding that this data is the new oil, right? That's, that's a cap. That, that's a cash line you'll hear a lot. Um, and it's really, really important. Um, asking the right questions. I, th I think this is, this is phenomenally critical and often overlooked. Um, a lot of companies approach AI and ML as, you know, this is, our, this is our Swiss Army knife to solve everything. But the thing is, is you really have to think about, okay, um, you know, you, you want to solve for X, right? But oftentimes the, the biggest value prop is solve for not X. If you, if you transform and you pivot questions in a way that, like, create more value, that's often the biggest area of lift and yield for companies, and it's just about asking the right questions. So always take a step back and think about how do you start to ask the right questions that, that, that are critical to your business, and, and how can you pivot questions that make more sense. Um, communicate and community. Um, I think this is, this is super important as well. Um, you really need to understand, like, how, how you're conveying um, interest in data across across business lines. I think that there becomes this question about, oh, we not, you know, we have differing priorities, this and that. But I think it's really just about communication. As long as there's transparency and communication, you really start to understand. Um, and, and the cool thing about yeah, data would, science and AI. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I was going to say the really cool thing that you're probably going to say is, you can learn a lot from other people, right? So this is about the AI and machine learning community is broad, it's, it's vast, 
Um, it, uh, there's a, about 180,000 uh, people in the H2O meetup community alone. Um, if you go to our website, we've got like learning paths, free trials. You can see what other people in the community are doing. You can interact with them. We have a Slack channel as well. So we think best practices really kind of center around what other people are doing, right? Just not just us telling um, you know you know prospects or customers what what to do, but what are others doing in the community? And I think that's what's great about having an open source community and an open transparent culture um, that you know you can share. We can we can all participate and find out. You know, what are some of the leading edge things that, that folks are doing? Um, and some of the simple things that you can learn from from others. Yeah, and so I'll actually make a more macro statement here too. I, I think the coolest thing about like AI, data science, machine learning, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, is the fact that there's this, there's this sort of like collective interest to, to better the practice. Um, my career started in finance where if you found a trading algorithm or a signal that created some alpha, you very aggressively safeguarded this information, right? Like you would, ne you would never tell anybody else. Um, however, in data science and machine learning, we're in this really cool era where if you find an algorithm that predicts better, you publish it and you let everybody know. So there's this really cool feedback loop of people trying to make things better and it gets circulated around. So, I, I, I mean, personally, I think it's awesome. Um, technology considerations, I think this is also critical, that I think um, a lot of companies want to start, you know, getting value from AI, ML, data science, but they don't think about, like, do they have the infrastructure to really, you know, put, put this up at scale? Um, so you need to think about how do, you, how, how do you create, how do you ingest, how do you store data, um, what are the kind of tools that you create to create value from models and predictive analytics? Um, this, 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 I mean, this might be the most critical thing, but I think it's, I, I think it's super important as, as your company is trying to start scaling in um, or a company advising a company starting to scale in, is thinking about, like, what is the technological infrastructure that exists and does it actually, you know, beget value from analytics? Because the thing is, is you'll hear this a lot, is, is with AIML is garbage in, garbage out. So you need to make sure that you're ingesting the right data and modeling on the right data to, to, to drive value. Uh, th th okay, this is actually my, my pedestal. Um, trust in AI is super important, right? I think one of the biggest things you see um, in industry is, okay, well, you know, backwards looking statistics has been good to tell me how things are, um, but our problem with AIML is you're telling me how things are going to be and how do I trust that, right? So there's a lot of different features to this that I think, you know, I could spend a million hours on. But I think it's really important as a company if you start to look into scaling into AI, thinking about how can you trust your models? How can you trust your data scientists? Where does trust, you know, rely in? And I think there's a lot of different angles you can take and we give talks on this all the time, but I think it's important to understand at least if you are in the business of making million, billion dollar decisions at your company with um, predictive models, whether, whether it be AI, ML, deep learning, what, what have you, um, it's important to understand how you can trust these models, what you can derive trust from, what are the things to look for. So, you know, that's kind of the, the late stage understanding of this is, 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 you know, you've gotten data, you've ingested it, you've created the platform to create models. How do we start to think about, like, how can I trust this prediction? Um, and this, this kind of gets tossed by the wayside more than it should, but it's really important to think about as you go forward. Um, because well, the and there's the day, a new class of, and there's a new class right now, which um, ben, ben is driving at H2O, which is called Responsible AI. And he did a webinar, I guess, last week, which you should look up. But it's all about what's the intersection between technology, regulations, ethics, you know, how do you document this? Um, and it's very important that we all understand that, you know, if we're talking about change management and, and the data culture, then people are going to say, well, but I don't trust AI, right? I don't understand it. What they, do, they don't trust what they don't understand. So, of course, what I would say is then you need to put into practice 
how do you, you know, with technology, with, uh, you know, common understanding and adhering to regulatory um, uh, practices here, that you are, you, you're conducting responsible AI. Yeah, I, I think this is super important, right? Like, I think, you know, I'm, I'm of the age where I watched the global financial crisis because our inability to model risk appropriately, and I also worked in an industry where we saw the, we, we saw very materially um, the financial risks of algorithms going wrong. And I think I kind of, you know, over my career, I saw this, 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 this era where, you know, algorithms were being used to perpetuate um, human bias. And, and I think it's super, super important to think about like what we want to do with AI is like it creates a ton of value, and I think it's it's probably the best technology we've been given or, or created. But I think it's really critical to understand like we also need to extract humans being bad out of it, and, and that's where responsibility and responsible AI comes in, and, and and those kinds of considerations create like best practices around you know making things better and not at the very least not perpetuating human bias. Um, so, how does it look? And, and, and I think, you know, th there's a lot of misunderstanding about your company. You want to scale into AI. How do you start to, like, really assess this? At, at least at H2O, we have a pretty efficient cycle. Um, the way that we think about it is pretty, you know, pretty linear and, and, you know, cyclical. What we like to do, and I think most firms should do, is you have to start with a data assessment. You have to start with interviews, stakeholder, you know, conversations, and grab data and figure out is the data that you collect or create the quality that you can actually or should model on top of, right? Like garbage in, garbage out. If it's not good, you should not perpetuate this data. Um, and, and a lot of companies have this problem. Like I think this is probably one of the biggest problems that exists. So knowing that, you know, we do a data assessment. We try to check is your data in quality that we'd like to, like, actually predict on top of. And then we start to run use case workshops, and I think this is, you know, the conversation that most companies want to have, right? I think companies want to start to talk about where, that they, where they believe AI or machine learning or data science should be applied to create value. Now, personally speaking, I think most of them have it wrong. Like, I think, you know, they'll bring up an issue that, that, that they think is top of mind, and it's often not the right one. You know, you can pivot it, you can transform it, and you can create way more value if you start to, like, really kind of get under the hood. But I think, you know, w w what happens in this industry is people think of, oh, let's use the most complex method, AI, to solve the most complex problem. A lot of value drives from very simple, very redundant use cases, and those are the better conversations to have. Automate the boring stuff with Python. Right? That's, that's a book that exists. I think everybody should read it. So we do use case workshops and we talk to customers and we think about, okay, what is actually like driving the, the, the problems of your business and how do we start to think about solving them? Um, we are very fortunate that we have this really phenomenal auto ML tool, driverless AI, that lets us rapidly prototype our, our solutions. Right? I think a, a lot of consulting firms will come in and they'll say, okay, we'll We'll build some models, we'll see if there's signal, and we'll, we'll kind of, like, go from there. We luckily have driverless that allows us to kind of rapidly automate our, you know, our, our workshop process and figure out, you know, is there signal? Should we predict on this? Can we drive value from this? What is the business application? And, and, and put this into production way faster than, you know, a bunch of consultants with Python, right? Um, model deployment, this is exactly what I was just talking about. It's about you know, putting models into production, whether it's an ATM fraud scanner um, to a churn prediction model, it's very quick for us to just kind of spin it up and see how it's working in production. And I think that's a lot of concerns for companies as well. Um, and, then, and then five, I think this is actually critical as well. It, it, it's about goal setting, right? Like I think, you know, when we get calls, it, it, you know, there, there might be two major buckets, whether it's like cost cutting or revenue driving. But I think everybody has an idea in mind about how do we start to solve problems with, with AI, ML, data science, right? And, and I think it's about, you know, we, we want to do use cases. We want to rapidly process. But we also want to talk to companies and make sure 
they know what they want to get out of this, and we want to level set with them constantly, understanding how we're how we're performing against these goals. So I think this is critical, um, and 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 it, it's really our best way to benchmark. You know, how are we doing against what we wanted to achieve? Because the funny thing about AI is that. Sometimes you create a lot of value that you didn't intend to, but we want to keep your core focus top of mind. I mean, that's, that's, that's how we operate. I, I can't speak for other folks, but, but that is something that we consider heavily. And I think, you know, it, it kind of materializes in the way that we built this company. I think H2O is easily the coolest company I've ever worked at. And the reason that we do this is, you know, we, we hired the best data scientists in the world to start to tell us how do we build a platform for data scientists by data scientists, right? And I think this is so critical. Like, we, you know, we talk about it all the time, but I think, you know, if you go to Kaggle and you look at the competitions and you see who's, who's performing, you'll see us. That's, that's our whole thing. And I think this, this, this Kaggle Grandmaster focus and the best data scientists focus has really helped us, like, hone in on the vision of this company, figuring out how do we build a platform to enable you better. And that's what we want to do for, you know, Fortune 100 companies is give you a platform that's built by the best data scientists in the world to give you everything, like the, the Swiss Army knife of data science. So you know what you need to predict and you know how to, how, how to think about it from a business user standpoint. So, you know, that's, that's, that's my platform. <laughs> Well, thank you, Ben. Um, um, that was great. And I just to, to reiterate, um, really, any company can go through an AI transformation, but they need to start considering, you know, the cultural implications of creating a data culture. They need to know where their data data is, how they want to deploy a model, what what answer, what questions are they trying to answer. Um, they need to figure out how. You know, they need to understand the trust implications, you know, the explainability, so to speak, of the AI, what's it doing. They need to be able to trust that and do it responsibly to guard against bias and things like that. Um, so those are the key ways in which we move a lot of people forward. Um, and um, I guess now I guess we'll turn it over to questions. Yeah. Um, thanks, Ingrid. Thanks, Ben. So we do have um, a couple questions here. and. Uh, everybody, please feel free to start typing your questions in. Uh, we'll use the rest of the time to address um, as many of them as we can. Uh, first question here is, uh, what are some of the best H2O customer experiences in leveraging deep learning? That's a great question. So deep learning is a great tool, you know, uh, to be used, but it's not really a, um, a silver bullet. But we do have customers. Um, quite a few, in fact, um, that are using it for you know, using deep learning, um, and mostly NLP, right, using deep learning for NLP, natural language processing. Um, and we're also looking at newer tech techniques like BERT and distal BERT, et cetera, for multi-class problems. But the most, of, uh, most of our customers are using it for, you know, call center analytics, like the one I just described earlier. Um, we've got customer service email analysis. So kind of using it for natural language processing. Yeah, so, so l let me actually just like piggyback on top of that. Um, there's a saying, I'm not going to say who originated it, but that deep learning is good for two things, um, getting academic publishing and getting venture capital funding. Um, the thing <laughs> is, is when you, get in, <laughs> when you get into semi or highly regulated industries, deep learning is not the silver bullet because – it's not, right. It has not been explainable for some piece of time. So if you want to talk about why did somebody's loan get rejected or mortgage application get rejected, it's not a good tool to, to understand, like, why that happened or why the model came up with the conclusion that it did. So in finance specifically, deep learning is not the silver bullet. And, and you'll see this more over time. But, yeah, we, we apply deep learning and natural language processing a lot. And this is an area that I think doesn't get enough focus, but it's super high lift when you talk about call center optimization, name entity recognition, top modeling. There's a bunch of very deep learning applications in, in, in text or unstructured language analytics right. that, that drive a ton of value. Right? And we see that with uh, a number of clients that we have. Yeah. Great. So Patrick, Great. next question? Next. 
Yes, next question is, um, you have the expertise, the software, and going back to your technology consideration slide, have you guys worked with firms to build new consumer-facing AI products, but the patent or IP belongs to the firm? Customer-facing AI products. Yes, I mean, um, absolutely. Um, so we see that. Um, we are working with a very large, um, one of the top four consulting firms right now, and they're building out new products based on H2O's technology, and they own the IP. So that is, uh, that is something that we, we see a lot. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, answer the question? Yeah, I, I believe so. Um, next question. Glad you talked about trust in AI. Some historical data has, been, has some bias built into it, such as gender or race. How do you make new AI-based products uh, that, is, that are more gender inclusive, age diverse, and multi-generational? Meaning, for anomalies like this, um, is this also addressed by AI, or are these more human or manual tweaks in the data? Yeah. Oh, Ben. Uh, so, so, Ingrid, <laughs> can, I, can I take this one? Yeah, no, go Ben. <laughs> this is yours. Yeah. So, so, so this is my pedestal, and I care about it very deeply. Um, you know, I, I worked in a business where we saw, you know, algorithms perpetuating human bias. Loan discrimination is one very common example, like fair lending is a, is a really popular example. The cool part about it is, and the way H2I has, H2O has been built around this, is that we've created tools to identify situations in the data set where it should have been a yes, but for some reason it was a no. And, and we're in this cool era of like algorithmic insight where we can actually say this should have been a yes, but for one feature, whether it be race, you know, gender, uh, geographic location, it was a no. Like that was a, that was a variable that was like disproportionately weighted to, to tell somebody no on, on a loan, right? Um, so I think what's really cool is that, you know, we got to this era of figuring out, okay, like is, is algorithmic discrimination happening? Are we finding situations of human bias? But even, even better now is we can use algorithms to identify something that should have been a yes that was a no for one feature that was disproportionately weighted. So... We're and we're doing that with driverless AI, AI, right? We built we built that into driverless AI. Be, I think we need to say it's been we've been focused on this with the machine learning interpretability capability and adding new algorithms um, all the time to make sure that we are guarding against bias that it's built into the product into the platform. Yeah, that's that's actually a critical point. Like I I harass H2O to let me work for them for for over a year at this point because I was like, you are the only one to understand this risk and how to, how to mitigate this risk, and it's critical. Uh, but the tools actually exist within the platform for us to actually find situations where we find human bias perpetuating into a model, and we can strip those out. So that's cool. It's, it's, it's about algorithms solving historical human bias, and that's awesome. I think it's awesome. Okay, next question. Hi. Excellent. Next question. Um, has H2O driverless again, that was AI built into ever... the Again, that's built into driverless AI. I want to make sure that those of you on the phone or on the webinar understand it's built in. It's not an add-on. It's part of the overall platform, and it's a key part of the platform. Okay. Great. All right. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> has H2O driverless AI ever been used to improve contract lifecycle management? Contract life cycle management. I'd have to check um, that one. Contract life cycle management. I'd need to know a little bit more. I'd love to have a chat about that. We may have something very close. Yeah, I Great. think so. Uh, I think at can least they send us an email? Rule, so How do they send us an email? Yeah, yeah. give us a shout. We'd love to. We'd love to look into it. Yeah, I just right. may not know that use case. Sure, sure. Um, now, uh, they're just asking the difference between predictive analysis and artificial intelligence. Go ahead, Ben. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, I, I don't know, Ingrid, you can jump in here too, but 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 I'll just give you my hot my hot take. Um, I don't think there's a a perfect definition for any of this. I think the math for artificial intelligence existed something like seventy years ago. Um, predictive analytics has been really like a really exciting uptick because we think about you know, analytics for a long time was looking backwards and telling you how things are. And predictive analytics were like telling you how things were going to be. Um, the way that I think about it is that our AI is this massive bucket. Any kind of algorithm or mathematical model to kind of replicate a human knowledge base or a decision. Um, and predictive analytics, or specifically machine learning, is 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 doing that via algorithms that can learn over time, that can adapt, that can evolve versus, you know, your typical, like, linear programming or optimization type, type function. So I think machine learning, deep learning are these, like, new learning algorithms that have really come out as a result of compute power, compute cost, and, and data availability. But I think, you know, AI is kind of the parent bucket of any time you're trying to, like, replicate human understanding. Right? And also do predictions completely based on historical as well as patterns that um, we see in the data to predict an outcome. I guess Great, next thank question. You. Is there any dependency on cloud vendors with respect to driverless AI? Well, so I'll take that one. So um, we run on every public cloud, um, Amazon, Microsoft, Azure, uh, GCP, Google Cloud Platform, as well as Oracle and IBM Cloud Private. Um, so we're completely agnostic to infrastructure. We want to run on-prem. We can run in a hybrid environment. Uh, we have ability to also um, do a virtual private cloud so you can manage your um, driverless AI instances um, in something we call enterprise puddle. A uh, number of companies using that to control their uh, usage of their cloud. Um, so yeah, we're agnostic, infrastructure agnostic, and actually data agnostic, uh, meaning we take any data source, and we can act on it. Great. Thank you. Um, next question is about, um, I guess, a previous, a previous uh, mention, where they're asking, what was the Python book, um, Automate with Python? I guess they're referring to a book that was mentioned earlier. Uh, yeah, so, so I'll take that. There's a book, there's a book that the PDF is, is available online. Um, automate the boring stuff with Python. Um, that was, I mean, for, for what it's worth, that was my introduction to coding. Was I, I hated a lot of rote tasks in my life, and there's a book called Automate the Boring Stuff with Python. So, you know, working with the data scientists on my old team, they love this book, and I, and I you know, I, I downloaded it and started to learn to code via that method. Yeah. The, the thing is, there's is other it, ways to learn as well. So I was going to say. Yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. I'm going to say there's other ways say, to learn as well. Say, like, <laughs> so, so I was just going to say. So, like, like there's yeah. other courses, like Andrew Ng's course, Coursera courses on AI for Everyone. It's great for business people. It's great, you know, for people just getting started to to take the eight or nine hour course. Uh, not that hard. Very explainable to just the lay person. I would encourage business people to take that. Um, I encourage pretty much everyone I meet to take that course. And then we have learning paths as well on our um, website that can take you through, you know, how to get started and show you also, you know, time series forecasting, so financial modeling or retail modeling um, using driverless AI. And these are all tutorials you can step through with our 21-day free trial um, and get you started. So there's a lot of different ways, I think, Ben was referencing something that he started using early on. Yeah, I think, I think the way to think about it is if, if you've had to do something, you know, every month, every week, every year of your life, that you think, oh, like, is there a way to automate this? There probably is, and you should look into it. Um, that's kind of how I found myself in the space because I, I thought there was a lot of value to be created from, you know, automating the root task that, that exists. So if you have that problem, think about it. I mean, either give us a call or handle it. But it's an important area to think about because 
the cool thing about AI and ML data science is that we've created, like, the technology exists that it can probably do better than, than you at solving that. So it's something to consider. Great, great. Uh, next question here is, you'd mentioned in one of the slides that 50% of companies use uh, the H2O open source platform. What is the recommended strategy from your end uh, to those customers to jump between open source and driverless AI? All right, so let me clarify that for a minute. So we believe there are about 20,000 organizations globally that use H2O open source. And of the Fortune uh, 500, about half of them are using H2O open source. So we don't always know about them because it's open source, right? So we find out, oh, you know, this large Fortune 100 company has already been using open source, and that's R and Python, you know, through the H2O open source framework. Um, and that's great. We, we love that. So that's democratizing AI, getting, you know, AI into the hands of more people. So how do you jump between open source, H2O, and driverless AI? We actually have a number of customers that use both. Right, so um, in the call center um, uh, example that I had, um, that customer started with you know H2O open source, then they found driverless AI, and they're actually using them in combination and you know moving models between the two. So you can get started in either place. You can get started with open source, and there's a lot we have tutorials for that, or you can get started with driverless AI. The beauty of driverless AI is we learn from what the open source users were doing over the last you know, several years and saw that they were doing a lot of things like feature engineering was super time consuming. So one of our Kaggle grandmasters automated that. And we would say it's one of the best automatic feature engineering platforms out there. We also added in the machine learning interpretability capabilities, which is what Ben's talking about and what he works on is you know, explainable and responsible AI. And so in driverless, say, and then there's automatic model deployment, it's just one of the many things you can do, and you can extend the platform with a whole other set of uh, your domain expertise and, and bring in your own scores and transformers into driverless AI with what we call recipes. So you have the ability to have a lot more flexibility um, and automation with driverless AI. It just depends on where you are in your journey. If you have a small data science team, driverless AI gives you an immediate lift. Um, if you've already been using H2O open source, you may want to use driverless AI to test against the models you already used, maybe to, to look at some of the results that you've been getting, um, and also really speed up your iteration of your training sets to get to results faster and use your, you know, your, your you know, data science acumen to, to ask more questions, get more answers faster. That's what we see. A yeah. lot of companies doing with driverless AI. Yeah, and I'm just going to piggyback off of that real quick. I think one of the one of the most misunderstood points of this is like pretty critical. Like, you know, when I used to go in and consult for companies, one of the problems was they didn't they, they couldn't get like quantitative or data science talent because there's a demand crunch. There's not enough data scientists to go around for the data science jobs that exist. But you still have companies that want to rapidly prototype and understand is there a signal or is there not signal in certain blocks of data, right? So I think driverless is really good. Um, you know, any, any order of mail is specifically driverless. Um, is, is really critical to understand, you know, rapidly understand is there a signal or should I look to, like, apply some data science work to this? And then you, you also just think about the fact that if there's not enough data scientists to go around, how do we keep them on profit or value driving activities like modeling or understanding signal versus like, you know, feature engineering or documentation, right? Because at banks, right. you know, model doc is it, it, very critical and it takes a ton of time. And you don't want to pay somebody a ludicrous amount of money to, to be creating like, you know, formal regulatory documents, you just want to have an application like drivers do it for you. So I think that's what's really critical, and that's where the segue starts to occur, is where you see companies who are like, okay, cool, we know that we have data that drives value, let's drive as much value as possible by, like, getting a tool that enables our data scientists or our quants to, like, you know, really perform at the level that, that, that they want to. All right, next question. Great. 
Next question, uh, has H2O, and I believe this is referring to driverless AI, but has H2O driverless mm -hmm. AI ever been used to process clinical trial data, such as drug dose optimization, uh, patient recruitment, et cetera? Yeah, we actually have a number of pharmaceutical companies that are working with us on um, not only they're starting to look at, you know, matching patients or, or I should say prospects to clinical trials, what's the best optimization to do that. A couple of pharma pharmas are doing that. Um, also, you know, they're looking at, you know, lifetime patient, uh, lifetime value of a patient and doctor and so forth and drug um, discovery as one of the other sets. But, yes, definitely in the cl clinical trials, that is starting to happen. Um, so, yeah, with driverless AI, large pharmas. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions from the audience. Um, so we can, we can give folks Four maybe another, <laughs> yeah, another, another couple minutes to get those final questions in. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, I want to let everybody know that the presentation is being recorded and the slides will be made available to you as well. You'll just have to use the same link that you used to log into the presentation today, and you'll find all the materials there. Um, so, yeah, just uh, yeah. we'll stand by I, for a I, couple more questions. I, I guess I'll make a point since, since, we, we, since we have some air time. I think what's really important to understand, this is kind of what I've, like, predicated my career on, is, like, you know, Companies struggle to understand frontier technologies, especially AI, because once you get into the prediction business, effectively modeling the value that you're going to drive from these technologies is, is, is not as uh, transparent as you'd want it to be. Um, and there's a lot of questions that come with it, right? Like if you're, if you're at a Fortune 500 company right now, your board is definitely asking you, what, what are you doing in the digital age? What are you doing with AI, machine learning, data science, data and analytics? Um, and the answer to that is not always so clear. Um, so it, it, it really requires you to have kind of like deep, salient, thoughtful questions as you start to go in this, in this direction. And I think it's pretty critical. Like I've, I've seen many, many companies misunderstand the risk and the value prop of some of these technologies. And that's what we're here to do, right? Like, I think H2O is awesome because we do, we do this where we, where we just put it out and we say, these are the considerations you really need to have if you start to segue into this new era for your company because it matters systemically, right? Like, I, I gave an example about trust and risk um, because I worked at companies where algorithmic errors cause billion-dollar, million-dollar errors. And, like, I think – it's just important for companies to understand how they start to segue into this and what they can expect. And that's, that's just not a question that I think enough people are asking. And I think we're doing an awesome job of at least trying to start the conversation around asking the right questions to get the right answers. And I think, I think that's critical. Great. Thanks, Ben. Um, I think this will be our final question. Um, is there any use case identified for utility companies? Yeah, I would think, um, I think we have an, a couple of utilities or, you know, energy companies that are using driverless AI actually globally um, outside of the U.S. But I think, you know, customer term prediction, pricing prediction, um, usage prediction, optimization, all of those, you know, whether they're in retail, like supply chain is a retail problem, but also just optimization of how you're dispensing resources. The other one is um, that I can think of very clearly that a lot of our, the, our telco customers are using in large-scale telcos are predictive maintenance. Like when is an outage going to happen? I can think clearly of something here in California. If we'd known that there was equipment that was about to fail, we might have replaced it sooner. So predictive maintenance is a big use case that we see um, and get in front of failures before they happen. So. Uh, I do believe we have a number of uh, utility customers, um, primarily outside of the U.S., actually maybe in the, um, yeah, outside of the U.S., but those are some of the use cases uh, you could see for utility companies as well. I, I will so say, as, as kind of like a cool counterexample is, 
Um, several years ago when I was working at a different company, one of, the, one of our clients wanted to come to us and do anomaly detection for their utility customers. Yeah, that, that's so another one, right? Was, Big one. Who, who was operating like a mar marijuana grow farm. And that was like one of their anomaly detections that they were looking to like identify. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's limitless cases for this. I think it's pretty. Limitless cases is what I would say for every industry. I mean, this isn't, <laughs> this isn't just for the banks and the financial services customers. Um, we see uh, AI machine learning applicable across industries, and we're in nearly every industry now on nearly every continent. Uh, actually, every continent but Antarctica. And, uh, you know, really proud of that. So if we can help you, we, you know, give us a shout, um, contact us. Semiconductor manufacturing process, predictive maintenance, yes. <laughs> I just read a question. Um, yeah, I think, it, I think so, it's awesome. Uh, you, again, manufacturing what? processes, predictive maintenance is a big one for us. Great. All right. I think that concludes the questions today. Uh, I want to thank. Ingrid and Ben for taking the time and doing a great presentation. I'd like to say thank you to everybody who joined us as well. Uh, the presentation slides and the recording will be made available on our Bright Talk channel. And have a great rest of your day. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thanks for joining.